Hi, this is Arun from arunsyoga.in. I am a software engineer who mostly work with Node.js, PHP and other backend technologies. And I am an open source contributor as well. I am a tantric by birth in a family which is passing tantric wisdom from generations to generations from past 2000 years of legacy. and got lucky to travel across india and got chances to study under various gurus from different backgrounds and disciplines you could connect with me in arunsyoga.in here i'm helping you to design a divine lifestyle which is based on vedic astrology tantra and other yogic system of understanding Hello today's podcast we are having a guest her name is Valentina Leo she is a teacher of erotic wisdom and an explorer of the tantric realms for over 20 years Valentina is a dagini holder of the freedom lineage from the tantric school of fascinating wonderment aka bismayo that spontaneously birth female teachers of pathless path she is madly in love with the mystery and the traditional tantric revelations of kashmir shaivism now she offers various courses on tantra both online and offline you could connect with her on www.eroticwisdom.org however today she is joining with us to discuss her journey as a tantrika her motherhood also serpent wisdom along with her chart the The contact details of the Valentina is being given on the description below. So, welcome to podcast series episode number 18, The Serpent Wisdom with Valentina Leo. <laughs> yeah, hi, um it's glad to um I I'm very glad that you have accepted my invitation to this particular podcast. and uh, you are uh, you are doing uh, training people in tantric path and you are uh, recognizing them as tantrikas and you are also a mother too so um, as a tantrika and growing up kids and uh, how do you feel like that and how did you started all this hola oh, So first of all thank you for having me and inviting me and uh, I feel really blessed and honored and um being a mother actually has been the biggest tantric teaching for me to accept reality as is and not as I wish it would be and every time I want to change my reality I'm resisting what's present and i think the the core of all the tantric teaching is absolute acceptance of the perfection of this present moment and when i can't see the per- perfection of this present moment is because i'm confused about my true nature and um, and so being a mother reminds me of this daily when i want to change things when i want to be in a different place uh, um physically and spiritually and having to come back to the present moment and see the gifts that uh, mothering brings and some of the gifts are you know really heartbreaking there is uh, unbearable beauty there is this ambiguity of um such deep ecstatic love and such deep heartbreaking at the same time and uh, and being able to be in the center of it all and um and receive uh, you know many blessing i i they arrive later you know the my daughter already is growing up and i'm already grieving the loss of her childhood and the gift that her childhood brought to me um i wasn't able to see it then when i was so deeply in it and now i see so much more creating a bit of time distance so yeah being a being a parent i think teach everybody to be really present really really present with what life brings and let go of personal like and dislike i think i learn a lot about selfless love and um to love even 
when I would, my preference would dictate, my like and dislike are not met, you know? And, um, and to still stay open and love. I think it's a wonderful teaching to have and I don't think I could understand it compassion as I do now if I didn't have a child that taught me that. So it's been hard for me in mothering. It hasn't been a sweet, uh, loving path. I've been a single mother for 10 years and, uh, and an entrepreneur, a teacher in my own right, um, creating my own income, um, completely living out of mainstream society. And so um, it hasn't been easy, but I think it made me strong and very determined. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's, I think it's the source of my power. My deepest power is that I'm a mother. And so I know what it feels like feeling ripped apart and pieces of me being taken and yet be present with an open heart and the fire of loving. So a true gift, even with all my resistance. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you got initiated into uh, the path of Tantra? Even how do you go to know about even the uh, Tantric path and this Tantric understanding? I was a punk uh, when I was in my early 20 and living in London. And the first time I heard about Kundalini was through a magician, a friend of mine that was into the magic of Alistair Crowley. And um, he told me about this inner power called Kundalini, this snake, black snake. <laughs> and all the symbology was really attractive. And um, we were rebellious, you know, and breaking the rules and wanting to go against the linearity of society. You know, we looked very aggressive as punk, but we were all like pieces of butters inside. I think we were all looking for love and true communication and relaxation in our expression of being human. And, um, and then I traveled to India following a party, a trans party in those days in London, I was taking a lot of psychedelic drugs and um, having wild exploration of my embodiment. And um, I arrived in India for a party in Rajasthan, was the sun eclipse of 1995. And I, I still don't know how I did it because in those days there was no cell phone, no internet, barely any email. I don't even remember if there were email or not. And uh, we, I managed to, we managed to find this village in the middle of nowhere in Rajasthan. Uh, that was on the line of the eclipse and so we could see the eclipse in full and was in a village abandoned by people and so we basically squatted it and people came from all over the world and um, we were maybe five to eight hundred people something like this this is what I remember and after that I went off on my own journey and I arrived in India and everybody I met I asked about Kundalini because this Magician told me in London, mm -hmm. in my punk, if you go to India, you must uh, learn about Kundalini. And someone told me about a man in Varanasi that was teaching Kundalini practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when I got to Varanasi, I went to see him. I don't even remember his name anymore. I remember he used to wear big red dots in his <laughs> forehead. He used to tell me that uh, when Kundalini is awakened, you can just do all your talent get enhanced. And so any instrument you'll pick up, you can play any song you want to sing, you'll hit the tune and um, you know the dances, you know everything basically. And, uh, but you know, I wasn't really into the path then. It was a curiosity. I used to see this teacher as a curiosity. And in reality, I was spending all my time in Asigat with the Italian smoking a shish and going into the inner realms, you know. But uh, India really blew me wide open. I mean, I was just mentioning to you, I met the sadhus and the agori. And, and I think I've always been a tantrika at heart because this, um, 
a spiritual character really took on me, maybe because they were the punk of the spiritual path, the rebels. <laughs> and, uh, and I felt uh, completely attracted to them, their boldness, their non-conformity, you know, like India, you know, your India is very, it conforms, you know, people are properly dressed and there is a sense of social acceptance and then you have the agori that are completely naked, covered in ashes with wild hair and, and, and scary eyes. And I was absolutely attracted by them. And then I saw Kali, you know, Varanasi had a lot of Kali shrine in, in, in the ghats and around temples and buildings. And I really liked, I was fascinated by this little shrine distributed in the city that weren't temple, they were just shrine to this goddess that also was fully black. And, uh, you know, as a punk, Kali was the symbol of absolute uh, irreverence and rebellion. She had the big tongue <laughs> out, you know, it's like uh, taking the peace to everything we know. Ah, uh, you think you know everything. Blah, let's tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> but the hand like this and they almost look like this <laughs> you know, it's different it's childlike you know you think you know you think you know who I am and you come to prostrate on my feet because you want me to be the one you think I am so it was like really breaking all taboos and, and of course, was really aligning with my temperament in that time. I was 25, I was new to the world. That was my first trip outside of Europe to come to India. <clears throat> really blow my mind, my heart to see how other people live. And, uh, and Kali really put a seed in my heart in those years. And... Um, and I remember I used to go to the temple and I used to do all the decoration and embodiment practice of, uh, you know, taking the flowers and have them bless and uh, having the, the Shiva uh, as a symbol on the forehead, the three big line and the tilak uh, and the pouring of the milk on the lingam, you know, all this ritualized action were really fascinating for me. And I was already leaning towards the performance arts and the dance and movement. And so all this gesture really awoke the artist in me that was already existing. You know, I was already into painting and uh, dressing up and performing. And um, so it was like a coming home. Suddenly something was, it was a recognition, you know, and, and now I know the, the recognition sutra and, and then I didn't know this that you know the tantric uh, revelation the tantric truth meets you as a knowing as a um, recognition that you already knew this that you're meeting now that drops in the body as an absolute knowing so there was an, definitely a recognition of myself into all this character and I was bold also because as a punk, I was wearing a Mohican. I had a blonde Mohican. And I arrived in India with like this Mohican. And uh, all the Indian people, I think they never saw anything like this in their life. I had a piercing in my tongue, which I kept showing everybody. I had a big ring around my lips and I had big earlobe and many hearing, many dangling stuff. But of course the Mohican was attracting a lot of attention and um, after the festival, I just shaved my head. And so I officially became a yogini. Mm -hmm. But in those days, I wasn't even doing yoga. I started a year later when I was 26. Mm -hmm. and, and so they saw in me almost my future. The people recognized me for the one that I was about to become in the, in the year to come, which I was still unaware of. I was just really playful about it. And so they called me Ganje, full moon. In, in Varanasi, actually, they gave me this name. And um, yeah, I guess this was my beginning, you know. And then, then I came to live to in Africa and I kept traveling back to India and I took on classical Indian dance mm -hmm. in the form of Odissi. 
And, um, you know, through Kali, I became familiar with Tantrism and uh, I started studying in the book and I chose Odyssey as a dance form because I read somewhere there was the dance form that was closest to the traditional Tantric teaching out of all the seven classical Indian dance. And so I started to travel regularly to Bhubaneswar mm -hmm. uh, in the capital of Orissa to, to learn the practice. And, um, and there, I mean, also by crazy paradox, my dance teacher was actually a Japanese woman, not an Indian woman. Mm -hmm. I mean, I also had some Indian uh, teacher that influenced me, but she was my principal teacher, which I would like uh, to invite you to interview her. She still lives in India. She's been living in Bhubaneswar now for mm -hmm. 20 plus year at the time. She's been there for 12 years. Now she's got an academy of dance. Mm -hmm. And, um, and um, yeah, and, and so it carried on, you know, the tradition of eroticism and sexuality from the temples, the temple of Konarak. And, uh, and to be honest, my meeting with the uh, not wanting, the, uh, the non-desire of an uh, Indian uh, teacher around me to, to dwell in the true erotic path of this dancer. You know, the Odyssey has a very strong erotic tradition that is completely unexplored and um, <coughs> to made forgotten and pushed underground, um, although it's so blatant in the temple, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was performing already and I remember in those years in South Africa and Cape Town mainly, I was painting myself completely blue and mm -hmm. I would wear all the garment of Shakti. I had a big golden crown and bracelet and I had a bell with dangling things, but I was always bare chested like I saw the dancer in the temples carved on the temple wall. And, um, you know, and I've always been lucky. My breast is small, so it wasn't too overt also, you know, and, and with the paint over, it wasn't like a point of immediate attraction, but I created a little bit of a scandal amongst the Hindu community in Durban in those days. And uh, I was always so impressed that when I was driving around Ubaneshwar, you can have this statue, enormous statue of naked women with the breast offering the abundance of love and nourishing of their breast to, mm -hmm. to the people. That, so these you know, are the, those, those structures are called Dakinis. In Buddhism, they call it as Dakinis. <coughs> Dagini, Dakini. Dakinis, yes, yes, yes. Uh, in yes, Buddhism, yes. they call it as Dakinis, and uh, in uh, Indian mysticism or the uh, temple mysticism related to that deity, it is called as Yakshas, Yakshas and Yakshinis, like Yakshis, we call it. It's like uh, the beings in another dimension. So they come and express yeah. themselves and they really open. The more you open, the more you receive. That is the truth, actually, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. It's, it's, it's the more kind of you see them, the more you see, you recognize Dakini everywhere. The more they show themselves up. Yeah. You know. Yeah. They they will more receive actually. Um, yeah. So, and also uh, uh, talking about your uh, 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 dance practices, I have. Uh, I think you remember the days you have done the uh, dance with the snake, right? <laughs> Yes, I, I did. Yeah, you done did that. The, you saw your, that. Yeah, I saw that. And also, yeah. if I'm not wrong, um, the most of the text you might be uh, reading from Daniel Odier, right? Yes, yes. Well, I did also, I read traditional texts from Jai Dev Singh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at the moment, Daniel Odier is the teacher that really inspire my heart he really yeah. cracked me open it's very interesting because i have i, I, his... I also has gone through some of his uh, writing like especially tantric coast uh, which he has written daniel odier has written a book which named this tantric coast you have you gone yeah that was the first book that i i read 20 years ago mm -hmm. and put me on a tantric quest and was mm -hmm. really interesting because I, I i didn't identify with him in the book 
Mm -hmm. I identify with like a baby. I wanted to become that one living in the mountain and <laughs> having a communion with God endlessly. Mm -hmm. And in those days, I said again, we didn't have internet. And I, I looked him up and he was teaching in French and I didn't mm -hmm. speak French. And the world seems so much bigger than it is now. And so I carried on following his writing, but I never imagined that I could meet him in person. Mm -hmm. And then he became a kind of um, forgotten, you know, a drop in my um, beginning teaching. And then I found other teacher along the path. Mm -hmm. And then I met him again when I was actually in my full maturity, you mm -hmm. know, and uh, I met him again about six, seven years ago. Mm -hmm. When I feel I was fully formed, I was already teaching Tantrism. Mm -hmm. and, um, and he closed the circle for me. And I completely fall in love with all the practice that he gave me a direct transmission of. And, um, and it's interesting that when I fully understood what uh, Dakini is, I could you know, start transmitting from that realm. And, um, and so he was, says, he initiated me mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and into the, the beginner's path. And then when I was ready to go into the depth, he, he appeared again in my life, this time in person. And mm -hmm. we've been meeting in person since then. I, I tried to connect with him at least once a year. Of course, now with COVID, it's been more difficult. And, um, and he really dropped me into the depth of the um, Dakini transmission. So mm -hmm. he is my beloved teacher. I, I have deep, deep love feeling for him. He really, he really touched my heart. And yeah. Some of uh, his work is actually like uh, what I personally feel is like, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, like, uh, it's, it's a kind of dream, you know, like, uh, even though he uh, convey a lot of messages in that, like, um, but some of the things are m mostly not possible, you know, like, uh, from a white female, white male perspective, he is coming from uh, outside of the India, it may not be possible, most of the things which he was writing about, but, but he has actually put something very great in detail in his some of his work. That I really appreciate, even. Uh, but yeah, this is what I would like to say after I'm going. Yeah, no, I think many people suspect that uh, the story it's a product of his imagination. If you ask him, when I ask him, is absolutely true for him. Lalita Devi exists, and uh, um, but I really love this because it's in the tradition of the tantric teaching. The truth is told by stories because the story really entered the imagination of the heart and opened the state of uh, wonderment <clears throat> with a childlike um, feeling. And when we are in the state of wonderment, we can imagine the unimaginable and the impossible can happen. And this teaching of tantrism, the way I understanding, are pushing our limited perception of reality in every moment is suggesting that there is so much more to reality that we can see and feel and dream of. And so to teach the teaching through imaginary character or story, I feel they really bring the, the, the deepest, um, the possibility of the learning that is from the heart, not the mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. You know, Daniel really uses this, which is a tantric practice, you know, of, of breaking the heart open and let the heart inform the mind. And when the heart is in a state of ecstatic love and wonderment, life is wonderful. There is no problem. <laughs> the, you know, there are no real challenges. Yeah. And so the possibility to live from there, he informed that and cultured that. Rather, other teachers that I found that are extremely scholarly in mm -hmm. the transmission of tantric text mm -hmm. and to me they become a little bit too dry there is always that piece that i i need to study more to get it i don't understand fully i'm never gonna get it i need mm -hmm. to read another book and read it three times and read it backward and there is more knowledge and is this chasing something mm -hmm. that i will always miss it if i don't go deep enough with the text 
Mm-hmm. And I also love that in, in, in the Tantic teaching, also there is this uh, um, um, stress, stress meaning it's spoken many times, is remitted, uh, reminded many times of the immediacy of the understanding. And that happened with the heart. And so with the stories, um, we open the heart. Yes. And when yes. we are in love, truth enters and then everybody can access it it's not a matter of who's uh, the greatest scholar and who studied for longer we are all equal there it's the arrow of kamadeva that just mm-hmm. enter and explode your heart and then in that i feel is really exciting because it's a possibility that's awaiting everybody yeah the getting it's access to the desire. getting access to the infinite you know uh, the finite beings. So uh, I have gone to your video of the dancing with the snake. So it's just a kind of symbolism that the when the Kundalini awoke and you were all you were uh, uh, like Alan Watts is talking about how you ever explored your uh, darker sides, you know. So um, when the real uh, explosion happens, it is like playing with the danger, you know. Like uh, the snake is awakening and it's uh, coming on your body and it's uh, going into you and you are getting one with the snake and things like that. So how do you explain your feeling with that dance or what made you to do that? Yeah, I have, um, I love Alan Watts as well. And it's, it's definitely one of my lovers from the infinite. I never met him in person, but he cracks my heart open. <coughs> relentlessly and um, yes loving your dark side I do also an online course called kissing the snake Mm -hmm. you know it's like really going to kiss your biggest fear to offer your loving and your body to that which we most fear because that's where a lot of potentials are held it's the unexplored and um so, you know, working with the snake was a, was a phase in my life. And as I told you, I was a performer and uh, it was creating a lot of uh, response in people. They, they love to have a snake dancer. And then in my exploration with that, I went underwater and we shot that video. And, um, you know, I have to say, I want to say this uh, publicly because uh, many people think the opposite. I'm still scared of snake. <laughs> Fear of snake never goes away, you know, <laughs> living there are cobras here that are deadly. We have deadly snakes in my garden right here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know they're there. I just don't go and put my feet there. Uh, but there is this constant awareness. And so I'm still scared of snake and I am mesmerized and attracted and still afraid. And I think that is to keep the polarity alive at once. And so that's why snakes are so, they're such a powerful symbol. And um, because we don't want them, we don't want to look at them, but yet we want to look at them mm-hmm. more. So it's like this, I don't want to look, but I'm looking like this. And so there is that pull and push. And so maintain this tension alive in the body that create life, you know, is the tension of the Tantra, you know, living in the, in the tension of being two things at the same time, attracted and afraid. And one of my teacher called this the excitement, the excitement and the fear, living together and to recognize it. And so the snake for me is still that, when I look at that video of me with the snake, you know, it was shot in 2006, was even before I became a mother. And when I look at that video, I don't see me anymore. I see this woman with the snake and I can also journey myself. Every time I see it, I I feel feelings, new feelings. I, I, I get lost in, I get mesmerized by that snake every single time. And um, so, yeah, I don't know what else you want me to say about snake. Snake is the very have... snake is the very important symbol in any kind of mysticism, whether it is in Western or Eastern or doesn't matter because it's 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 equally um, 
mesmerizing it's equally we are actually frightened about the snake also the seduction of the snake is much more than that of the you know the fright and the and love another and money man. yes is mesmerizing is enchanting yeah. and truth is like that you know the mystery is like that is scary and mesmerizing kali is like that is terrifying and yet so attractive you know you want to enter the dark body to find more of yourself we want to know about yourself and we are also scared of the self mm -hmm. of meeting ourselves represent that ongoing polarity also daniel odier very beautiful say that the snake also remind us of the the movement of our spine and so the mm. natural movement of the body the undulation of the sound waves that create reality and also the movement of the sperm that is looking for the egg and so mm -hmm. this is also our origin is where we come from and so we are naturally attracted to go back to our place of source um so you want to say something more about the snake or uh, shall we go to I wanted chat? to say this thing uh, keep coming into mind while I'm talking to you and I haven't thought about it for many years because we were talking about Bhubaneshwari and me studying the dance and then I became friend with the Brahmin at mm -hmm. the Mukteshwara temple which was one of the Shiva temple in Bhubaneshwar and after before i was leaving you know i used to go visit him often and share the dance and um you know ask him a lot of questions he became my guide he took me to the 64 yogini temple in irapur and he took me to many special um secret sites of worshiping because he was a brahmin and mm -hmm. had access to that and so before i was leaving you know he asked me to choose an agini from the temple Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for the one that are listening and they don't know, Nagini are a little statue, a um, little carving in the temple of beings, carving of um, archetypal <laughs> beings, maybe it adds your, your knowledge of it, that have a body that is half human and half snake. So mm -hmm. the bottom of the body is a Naga, mm -hmm. is a Naga being. And, and I choose one that was my Nagini, and we call it a Tina Nagini, because in India, Valentina was too much of a mouthful. And people just called me Tina, Tina Didi, Tina Didi. <laughs> and so we find Tina Nagini. And, uh, and I have this deep desire, some days I really think I want to go back to Mukteshwar temple and, and see if I find her again. <laughs> so, <laughs> part yeah. of me you know, immortalized there with the body of a snake. And yeah, it's like a blessing. It's like, um, it's like this, this beautiful man held uh, a place for me in the temple of Shiva. And um, I felt it really supported my, my journey of awakening and that is still happening with a lot of love and care. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything more to say about Nagini. <laughs> so uh, one thing, what are the uh, courses you offer online? Like What courses I offer? I do mm -hmm. a three-day immersion called Kissing the Snake, where mm -hmm. we meeting for three days back to back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very intuitive teaching, you know. So Is that online? I, it's online in July. Mm -hmm. And um, and then after that is a test to see if you like to work with me, mm -hmm. if I awaken something in, in your being, because I think we have to choose our teacher according to the level of seduction, you know, if they mm -hmm. seduce our body or our mind, not because someone told us that they valid. Mm -hmm. And so if that really moves people, then they can come on a um, six weeks online course called um, Riding the Tiger. So first mm -hmm. we kiss the snake. And then if you manage to kiss your fear, to invite your fear, then we're riding. Mm -hmm. We're riding the tiger of life, the tiger of your heart. The, it's the fierceless path of uh, passionate living on the planet. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then I do in-person event. You know, mm -hmm. people are really welcome to come and find me in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm shortly going to move to Bali and perhaps relocating there. We're going to see how that moves. Mm -hmm. And then I work privately with people on personal intensive and... Mm -hmm. um, 
where we meet regularly and yeah i'm also creative in my teaching i don't have a major structure put in place mm -hmm. um you know i i went through a whole journey where i went very academic especially when i was studying the classical indian dance and I did a lot of research in the library of Orissa and uh, I was surrounded by people doing their PhD while they were dancing. And so I got really taken by the academic stream. And, um, and now since I turned 50, which is like six months ago, mm -hmm. I almost six months ago, I really feel I'm going through a transformation, a complete snake <laughs> <laughs> transformation. And I, I landed the school, the Tantra School of Erotic Wisdom is, is really new, although I've been teaching for 10 years, I've always mm -hmm. been teaching in my own capacity. And now my students really started pressing me to, to create forma, a format to the teaching that people can, mm -hmm. can access me, because until now you really had to come and find me. Because I do live the archetype of the Dakini, and, um, and so my teaching are really embodied and they are absolutely intuitive mm -hmm. and they are fierceless you know I'm, I'm really direct in the teaching I don't I don't look for shortcut I'm not afraid to intimidate my student I think that when we are a little bit afraid we we show up more there is more of us or either it's too much and then we walk away and then mm -hmm. I'm not your teacher clearly but if that quality of intimidation attracts you, I think then there is a possibility of really breaking through everything that is not true in your being, all the filters and the, the story we tell ourselves about ourselves. And I'm really interested in dropping into the erotic wisdom that is the heart knowing. So it's the mm -hmm. experience of really being alive in the body. And of course, I'm using text uh, I lean on um, the Vigyana Bharava Tantra, the Spandakarika, the Recognition Sutra. You know, I use those three, the Shiva Sutra, they were very pivotal for my awakening. Mm -hmm. I mean, Shiva Sutra <coughs> enlightened me when I came across the passage about fascinating wonderment and uh, the attitude of Vismayo, you know, the almost halfway through it speaks about uh, the quality of the accomplished masters the accomplished tantric yogi is the one that lives every moment uh, in the quality of Vismaya that is translated as fascinating wonderment. Mm -hmm. And that piece landed in my being and exploded me for years. I still teach basically the essence of this teaching. And so my school really is the school of fascinating wonderment. And um, which is an erotic experience because uh, it belongs to the sensing and the state of wonderment and also this childlike attitude towards life. Mm -hmm. So this is mainly where I come in, uh, what is my style of teaching, um, my flavor, let's put it that way. I think every teacher has different um, aspect of understanding and awakening in their body. And so I think we, we all bring something particularly unique. So that's, I feel that's my unique approach. So <clears throat> um, I also run a program which is online. It's uh, a Kundalini yoga meditation, like uh, uh, rectifying the yantras on our body, like all the seven chakras. That is the first thing we have to do, rectify our uh, um, Yendras, so that we can actually pass the prana through all these yendras uh, and become merged with the um, unknown or whatsoever. I'll send you that video for that. Like, because it's why when I say it's unknown or whatsoever, it's because it's, it's a, we can only say it's in that way, but it is, <clears throat> it is beyond that, you know. Mm. Like words are always limited, you know, whatever we are communicating is always limited because it comes out of uh, our own social conditioning, like whether you, the culture you have grown up or the background. Yeah. So it's all limited, but the experience is always same, you know, because yeah, the, the truth is only one. Truth is only the one. 
Yeah, the experience can uh, become unlimited, can throw your body into the space of complete uh, unbounded freedom. Mm -hmm. Like it's undescribable in words, but yeah. the body can take us there. So I, I totally believe we have to practice with the body. Mm -hmm. Expand the mind. I also believe that reading some traditional book, it's really important. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, because because they, those people are there all, already. They've been there. So our job will be much more easier. We don't have to do all the experiments with ourselves, you know? <laughs> yeah. And also the tradition has a very beautiful language, you know, the twilight language of the text that uh, sometimes is, um, it just has words that are so rich and put together in such way that really expand the thinking brain as well. And we can start dwelling in the, unimaginable yeah you know one of my friend and teacher always say you have to be real you have to think the unimaginable <laughs> you have to think the unreal because that's reality that uh, it's it's beyond um the limit of the thinking brain and so the the text really establish a like a map or a groundwork mm. And for them, the practices are unfolding, like opening flowers onto this groundwork. It's like Shiva on the floor. I really love this picture of Shiva in Shavasana with the mm -hmm. erect phallus, mm -hmm. which is all potential. It's the unimaginable mm -hmm. because it's that beyond whatever is being created already. And so therefore belongs to the uh, absolutely unknown. Mm -hmm. and, and Shakti, Kali, the feminine sits on the phallus takes it in absorbed all potential mm -hmm. and where she touch and love makes it into a reality. And okay. so it's by virtue of this dance, always absolutely unlimited and infinite. And so the quality of fantasy and wonderment, that's why I think the book of Daniel Odieri's language, his poetic language is absolutely essential to mm -hmm. imagine the unimaginable, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so I also really, I'm really fond of Lala, the poetess of Kashmir. I don't know if you're familiar with her poetry. Which one? Lala, Laleshwari, Lal Dev. No, no, I don't know. She's a mystic poetess of mm -hmm. Kashmir, also lived about a thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the story, who knows if she also was for real or not, but uh, in Kashmir, uh, they still sing her song. So there's been a oral tradition of her song that, that mm -hmm. became popular um, cultural expression at a wedding and social gathering. And it was said that she, when she reached enlightenment at the age of 13, 14 years old, um, she dropped all her clothing and she wandered Kashmir in complete mm -hmm. naked awareness in, mm -hmm. in, in the nude, <laughs> singing her song. And yeah. what I love about it is that she's an absolute feminine embodiment of teaching. So she never wrote books like uh, Abhinava Gupta <laughs> <laughs> and that lived at the same time. And she never created a school of thoughts, mm -hmm. but she just offered her body to the experience of truth. And so she was naked and she was making love to reality mm -hmm. and she was singing the teaching. So you don't get the teaching of Lala, you get the song of Lala, <laughs> which are poem. And so I love this, that truth can be also sung and dance and uh, um, dissolved into the expression of my love. And it's not just received in linear writing on textbook. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up a, a Christian, so of course we have the Bible and the evangelie, um, the Gospels. There, there, there was a yogini which I heard about, her name is Akama Devi. Uh, she was also like, she was so fond of uh, Shiva. She get lost in Shiva. So what happened is like, uh, um, she thrown out all her clothing. She roamed around naked and she started singing the song uh, that comes out from the love of Shiva. It's full of Shiva, oh. Akama Devi. Her, Akama Devi? Akama Devi. Her name was Akama Devi. A-K-A-M-A? -A -A? Uh, like Kama? 
Wow, interesting. There has the word kama, desire and love. Sounds like uh, Lalita uh, Lala, um, Laleshwari, perhaps is the same archetype of, of practitioner, mm -hmm. you know, that, that maybe in some tradition is remembered with different names. I, I love this. I'm going to look her up. Thank you. <laughs> Akama Devi. Um, so, yeah, let's uh, go to your uh, chart. You want to see what yeah. your chart is going to say about you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm just going to share you. Um, you have the printed version of the chart with you? Yes. Do, do you want me to open it up in front of me? Do I need to look mm, at it? Yeah, if you want. Um. So basically, uh, I would like to start from your nakshatra, which is like Hasta. Hasta is the Sanskrit term, which could be translated into English, uh, saying it's like a hand, okay? Oh, yes. The mudra, hasta. the hasta, you did it yeah. into the dance. Yeah. Exactly. So this is uh, um, the hand. <clears throat> and uh, what happens is like whoever has this particular nakshatra has a particular ability to do something with the hand. Like they can heal people by touching. They can uh, do artwork. Like extra spe uh, special activities they could do with the uh, their hand mm -hmm. probably in the case of you it might be uh, healing because the uh, mm, the erotic uh, performances whatever you do it's basically a kind of healing it actually heals the people yeah i i like to think it more in term of it inspire them into a recognition of who they truly are and I'm, I'm really not to I don't use the word healing a lot because healing implying that there is disease and brokenness and we need to fix um, something. No, I when I meant the word healing, it doesn't mean that physical healing. Like healing in it's another like healing. I, another dimension, like you know, the metaphysical uh, dimension. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, it's clearing the confusion to that that take keeps you away from your true, true nature. A true understanding of reality. But I found that uh, in contemporary language, it's this word is a little bit abused. That's why I avoid using it. And many people comes for Tantra healing because they have, uh, you know, sexual trauma. And they think this uh, practice can heal the trauma. And it's not really a healing practice, Tantrism. It's a practice of remembrance. And that remembrance will put everything in order again. See, so, I would like to say the healing in this term, the conditioning. See, if people feel themselves sick, if they are conditioned, because they are bounded to so many things, like uh, uh, they are actually doing a life of enslavement. If they are, uh, if they are feels like. Uh, uh, um, bounded, if they are conditioned, they feel like uh, mm -hmm. they are actually living a life of slavement. So that is an unhealed life. It's a diseased life, <laughs> you see? Yeah, I understand what you mean. Still, I have a preference not mm -hmm. to, to understand that there is, it's Shiva too. <laughs> Even <laughs> a, an apparent broken life is still Shiva having an experience of himself and so, in, in the virtue of that cannot be broken, is still part of the perfection of reality. But I, I fully understand what you're meaning. I'm, 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 I'm being a little, a little bit pedantic here. So <laughs> let, <laughs> let's do this. I understand what you're meaning. I understand absolutely what you're meaning. And um, it's valid. It's valid. So that is Validity. the Hatha Nachatra. Usually uh, they have the ability. So this is your tree, Ampadam. Okay. Aha. Uh -huh. 
so this is a tropical tree what does it does is like you have a kind of resonance frequency every body has a resonance frequency so when you come near to this particular tree this will actually start to vibrate uh, on the level of your body so which means that you can easily connect with the this particular tree in tantrism we know that once we realize we actually understand that we are we are the universe Mm-hmm. We are the microcosm of the microcosm. Yeah, yeah. So when you come near to this particular so, tree, this can actually connect with you. You know, you see. So is this um, where is indigenous of? Uh, meaning? Is are these the many name that uh, is this uh, jasmine tree? Mula, no, mula. No. No, 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 no. This is ambaram. it is there on the link which i have shared you there is your nakshatra link is there on the chart which i have shared you if you click on that you can come to my website on this particular page and you can see uh, more about this particular tree ambaram ah uh, okay <coughs> okay so so this that you are showing now you sharing the screen your computer screen this is specific on my reading it is there on your reading on the chart which i have shared okay. you Okay okay sorry i didn't uh, look before i saw something else that um, confused me i didn't now look so clear <laughs> <laughs> okay so this is how the, your nakshatra will looks like on the sky hmm if you look at on the sky the uh, moment you got birth the ascendant was there on sky so that area there will be a group of stars so that starts in india we named it as hasta and it will looks like uh, in this way uh, alpha beta lambda gamma and epsilon corbi hmm so this is like you are devagana devagana means uh, you are uh, like there is three gana one is asura manusha and uh, god okay so you are devagana so you have the uh, ability to be like a god like uplift people to talk to people and things like that you know mm. so rajo guna this nakshatra has the guna of rajas so which means that you like more spicy <laughs> like snake oh yes <laughs> chili and intensity of experience <laughs> <laughs> so things like that so that is it and uh, your god is agni okay which means that you can burn things very easily you get very mm. angry like kali and you will get burned <laughs> you can burn things you know yeah it's so yeah. when i am saying burning i am talking it's in a metaphysical level it's not like um, you know a uh, physical layer yeah yeah yes so you have the uh, masculine quality is more uh, rather than that of the uh, shakti quality mm mm-hmm. I do. <laughs> I do feel more masculine I, than feminine, actually. Although I appear very feminine. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Particularly my desire for emptiness and freedom. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um. Mm. so you have more connected with this uh, savitar god okay if you um, uh, this is like a pure land uh, <clears throat> if we talk if we want to talk more about this we have to talk more about the pure land buddhism if you see this land in a metaphysical realm uh, that area there is a metaphysical entity is existing so in yogis in india called it as savitar so you could actually connect with <coughs> this particular god using some kind of mantras hmm. so it's not exactly like a god it's like a, um a metaphysical entity okay so you should understand that there is no god in india actually even though there is thousands of gods 
there is we don't believe in god you don't believe in god no we feel in india like we uh, our, we see the life as the uh, uh, it's is for liberation is to experience god is not to uh, it's not to worship god you know is to experience god hmm it's really beautiful worshiping is two different things in tantra we actually experience we figure out a way to experience it yeah yeah and the worship it's it's finalized to the experience you know when it's, it's you like act a worship. worshiping is like a jesus jesus is a god you worship me you will come to hell if if you don't worship me you will go to hell if you worship me you will come to heaven mm-hmm. so in india that kind of concept is not there Mm-hmm. But I in India there is a lot of worship of uh, murti and <coughs> it's murti it's deity it's not god it's, it's not deities god. deities okay yeah. okay so define for me what a deity is it's an avatar for god how do you define it exactly it's an avatar it's like you can be become god that is the important thing if you do some certain yoga practices and practice some mantras and things like that you will be become god or well, you will remember that you are god already you've been all along yeah <laughs> <laughs> to say like no? <laughs> instead of becoming it's taking away all the layer that made you forget that you are it already yes exactly it's already revealed so, so i also, also feel got- the part the part the path of tantra for me it's a journey into revelation and you know i call the tantric revelation more than teaching because it's a path that reveals what's already here by we take away that everything that is untrue you know the narrative the false beliefs <clears throat> everything that is in the way for um for your true self to reveal itself which is god it's Yeah, exactly so these people or the these deities which you can see in uh, india is actually somebody like me or somebody like you who have already walked in this path already walked in this land and they expressed some qualities and they used some techniques to reach that level of uh, um, you know that level of uh, clarity in their life so same technique that is somebody is for tantra somebody is for yoga and somebody is for bhakti things like that so that is what in happens in india so do you believe that shiva was a true blue being that dance <coughs> is tandava dance on the planet that really walked this earth shiva was form? walked on earth hmm shiva he is- walked on this land actually earth and so was vishnu and rama and ganesh all those people all those people okay <laughs> and uh, how long ago do you have an idea like maybe 4000 5000 if we see the skanda puranam and all those things uh, krishna and all was walked around 5000 years ago krishna rama and all those guys has walked uh, 3000 5000 years bigger than our human side like giants i had this uh, idea that they were really big and see the and size is relative <laughs> do you understand mm-hmm. that the size is relative actually yeah to a point i mean i think in the description of the deity they always appear so big and uh, and human so small and uh, in the in the traditional uh, um historical teaching we were told this because people see them so powerful and depicted them so big see the thing is like think- when you when you become the core when um, see krishna was not that big he lived among the people and he even fought the fight you know he even fought the war actually uh, in mahabharata and all he how killed thousands of people krishna and when he become big he, when uh, arjuna was asked him can you show me your real size i mean your real uh, actual thing so he become very big in that particular moment 
and what is hmm. that actually what is that actually happening when you drop your self identity i am this body you will be become nothing is also as same as you become everything mm mm-hmm. mm mm-hmm. you see the body of the universe the body consciousness when the body consciousness loses you become nothing and it is also as same as you become everything yeah absolutely you see that is the thing so krishna become yeah. nothing in that particular moment and he become everything so he become big <laughs> it doesn't mean that he is actually big yeah in metaphysically yeah. it is true that is why i am saying it is relative yeah yeah i agree with you i always i also <laughs> you know i i let myself not to believe anything too strongly because mm-hmm. i think we we lose freedom when we yeah that is what the thing system. that is what the thing of the uh, belief the difference between this semitic religion and the religions from east we says don't yeah. believe anything yes and that's freedom that's freedom and it's beautiful and jesus and so says what so- the semitic religion says believe me i am the one so that is the yeah. difference, main yeah. difference we said yeah. don't believe me krishna says don't believe me <laughs> you know you but see? also in the tradition of uh, in the school of tantrism you know mm. there is a lot of sometimes i see strong rigidity in what is taken to be truth like for example that even Ab- abhinava gupta really mm-hmm. lived you know do we know that for sure <laughs> could be another inspiring character created to entice our curiosity to know true and and so for me everything is possible and i always had this idea that shiva perhaps really walked this planet that is not a symbol you know and in, in a lot of uh, tantric texts uh, is just held as a symbol of the absolute reality and sometimes i think no maybe it's not a symbol maybe it was a real blue man that walked yeah. this planet he, he like may not be say, blue he may not be blue Uh, Why not? He was a man. He walked in. Uh... <laughs> I like him to be blue. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. Blue. okay let him be. <laughs> <laughs> take it away from me. <laughs> me dark blue. <laughs> sky blue. The sky at night. Midnight blue. <laughs> yeah it's uh, good uh, it's uh, that the uh, the uh, tantric teaching he has revealed uh, mahabhairava tantra he was saying one of his meditation technique is to just imagine just look at on the sky and you are there yeah you know yeah <laughs> and that's my body that's his body yeah that's the body that's of body. <laughs> yeah yeah just look at on yeah. the sky and you are already there you don't have to see <laughs> Yes, yes, so true, eh? Very beautiful. Yeah. I love the simplicity of this teaching, you see, that's why I I really embrace tantrism because they are sometimes excruciatingly simple, you know, that are so simple they break the heart immediately. And that's mm-hmm. why many people can't receive them because we've lost the sense of simplicity you know we believe that true intelligence has to be expressed with complication and knowledge has to be complex and complicated or is not true knowledge and the tantric teaching dissolve that mm, yeah <laughs> instant so let's uh, go to so there is a kriya there is a vidya like uh, a video which, which which is like yoga and kriya that helps you to uh, breathe deeply and uh, to be it's, it's, a, it's another technique whether you want to do it or not you can do okay there is a video all right so this is the uh, your uh, sexual type is buffalo buffalo yoni so this will actually uh, this practice will actually give you more intimacy with your partner all right yeah that's a position i like to to take i recognize that yeah it's a comfort place mm-hmm. 
so here mm. you know uh, hands is on each other's heart heart mm -hmm. so this is yeah. actually creating the trust so yeah this is the uh, mostly about your nakshatra so now we will go to your chart actually Ah this. yes, this this I looked, this I saw. I no. opened this, yeah. But you know, I couldn't de de decipher any of this. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a cryptic language. <laughs> <laughs> this is a cryptic language for the unknown. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> We just talk about this extreme simplicity. You throwing everything off with this <laughs> cryptic <laughs> language. <laughs> no, the, the the complicated thing is the most simplest thing. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you is the simple complexity. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the dialectic is the real reality. Mm. In philosophy, mm. there is a term called dialectic. It's like uh, yes, you understand like yes, the, yes, yes. It's middle of the two, the complex is as same as most simple. That is the dialectic, yeah. you know. That's the dialectic to make the complex simple to be understood. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in Tanu Bhava, there is ascendant is standing. So ascendant means that is where you get birth. So Tanu. So you are a self-centered person. Mm. <clears throat> that is what it's revealing. And the, the Bandhu, Ketu is staying. Bandhu means the friend. So Ketu is actually um, what's along with the occult understanding and stuff like that. You see? I don't know where you are looking. Where mm -hmm. is Bindu? Ketu, Ketu is here, Bindu. Ah, okay, okay. So here okay. Ketu is staying. So Ketu is the planet that is associated with occult understanding. Okay. Occult and magic and things like that. So that is your friend. Does that mean I've got an affinity with that? What is it? Uh, yeah, you have an affinity with that. And the, the Putra Bhava, the fifth house, there is moon is staying. Moon is like a feminine. So your kid will be fem, feminine quality. Maybe you have a daughter, right? Yeah. So that is like feminine quality. Yeah. And the sixth house, Venus and Mars is staying. That is your uh, enemy. <clears throat> Venus is actually like... Uh, um, uh, the more thing like uh, uh, Venus is the planet which is associated with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, all those things. Mm -hmm. Then Mars is the planet is battle, it's a fight. So mm -hmm. these two two things are your enemy. Like uh, when you walk on the uh, tantric path, you should be always aware that. I am actually walking with the pleasure. Without neglecting the pleasure, I am walking on the soul. So when you see that pleasure is there, not losing self and get into pleasure rather than focusing on happiness only can help us to get there. Mm -hmm. You see, so one basically what I what I hear you saying that these are my potential deviation from the path, my enemy in a sense yeah. that could distract me to get into passionate uh, sex and uh, drugs and rock and roll, the deviation of from the path and, and maybe fighting, confrontation. Fighting, Is that what like you get angry very easily, you fight, get into fight very easily. I used to. I used to. I, I, I say that so I, it's, it's not like uh, you have to avoid all those things. When I'm saying uh, you should be aware, awareness is different from avoiding. Aware. You see? 
Yeah, you call them my enemy. That's why I thought they were the potential destruction, like that they you there. Should be like even aware, aware. You should be aware of that. Mm -hmm. When mm -hmm. you are walking on the path of pleasure, you should be aware that you are walking on the path of pleasure. It's not like you yeah. should not go to the path of pleasure. Because pleasure has to be there, otherwise life will get bored, do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dry. <laughs> Too dry. <laughs> And Jupiter is staying as the Yubati. Yubati, your relationship is always you look for uh, wisdom. <clears throat> I do. <clears throat> Even you are in a, in a quarrel with somebody also, you always look for the wisdom in that quarreling. That is a good quality. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So, Rendra Baba, Sun and Mercury is staying. <clears throat> uh, Mercury is the planet which is associated with the speech, your words. And Sun is your uh, uh, father, probably, like a masculine influence in your house. So, that too is staying on your uh, Rendra house, which means that that could, uh, that could make you to deviate from your path. Those two are Sun and Mercury. Tell me Mercury again. So Sun is a ma masculine quality that could be your father, okay? And the mm -hmm. Mercury, Mercury is the speech. So yes. this, if you have, maybe in your life, there will be a quarreling with your father. Uh, you have your father alive right now? Yeah, not on, on the threshold of another um, reality. He's got um, Alzheimer, and so he's not consciously aware of his reality or, or the reality as we see it. I don't know what's his reality at the moment, but we don't have a social relationship any longer. He doesn't recognize me anymore, and he, he's, he's lost in his mind a little bit. So, but I had I had a lot of quarrel with my father when he was alive. He was a very strong man um, of the mind, and um, yeah, we confronted many many times. Was yeah, it was a hard relationship from that aspect. Yeah. So that's what it is saying. Sun and Mercury is staying together, like speech and father. That yeah. is in your Rendra. That which means that that could actually uh, 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 make your soul tired, you know? Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. On the Karma Bhava, there is Rahu is staying. Rahu is the um, obsession. You, you are very obsessive in your uh, uh, work you do. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I will look into that. <laughs> I thought I was just dedicated. <laughs> Deeply dedicated. But you are okay, obsessed. <laughs> okay, get up. So karma here, it's on the, on the work in my expression in the world? Yeah, karma is what you create in the world in order to pass through this particular realm of existence so i i sorry when you spoke about the sun and mercury i was looking at number eight randra mm. um, and i see that in the dharma they are under rasi so it's rasi the quality of expression and bhavam the quality of uh, potential danger no, no, Bhava. Uh, no, no, Rashi is how the it is counts from the first house. Like, uh, um, see this chart. So, this is like Rashi, like first house, second house, third house, fourth house, fifth house. Starts from here. That is Rashi. Yeah. And ascendant is here. That is second house. If we count from here, that is Bhava. Okay. You understood? Yes, sort of. 
<sighs> so in my dharma, the sun and Mercury, what what does it mean in the number nine? That we usually don't see the Rashi for uh, getting uh, an absolute understanding. We see the Bhavam over here. Looking at the Bhavam. Yeah, this is the, you see this column. Okay, okay. And so in the, in the number nine in the Dharma, there is nothing. Nothing. We just, yeah. Okay. I was curious about that, you know, because we always talk so much about Dharma. And uh, you want the... to know about your Dharma, right? Mm -hmm. So that is Nand House. Nand House, that is like Ascendant. Ascendant and Moon. So what you what your dharma is moon is actually looking at on the tenth house, which is related to your daughter. Ah. And yourself. So this is the two in, priorities in your life right now. Mm. So the use of the chart reading is to understand these are the things which is staying on my uh, life and to liberate from that thing. It's not to get attached to this, okay? <laughs> you understood? Yeah. Yeah. So this is 10, 7, 17, 27, 27, 8, um now you are in jupiter bhava which means that mostly like uh, 18 28 28 plus 7 uh, uh, 35 from the age of 35 you started to focus mostly in wisdom mm. what happened at the age of 35 What happened at the age of 35? Yeah. I had my daughter when I was 38. What you got? Um, I was 38 when my daughter was born. Mm -hmm. um, I can't recall anything in specific at the age of 35. I was really depressed at 36, I think. <laughs> Yeah, so I remember it was a shift. That, that, that was the shift actually. Jupiter, Jupiter comes in that time. Jupiter is actually wisdom. So when you get depressed, what it's, it's a product of whatever the chemicals or whatever the things which comes into our mind or our body is actually depressing our mind. You see, it's, it's not a psychological effect. It's a, it's a, a spiritual effect. Yeah. It felt like that, like an expansion of my myself and not knowing any longer. I was very unsure about my future, what to do, where to go, where to be. Um, yeah. So from that point of time, it will change, you see. You learn so many things from 35, 36, 37 and a half. Till the age of 37 and a half, you have learned a lot of things. Hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna sit and meditate on this after. I'm gonna think I will revisit maybe some events in my life in that time. That's interesting to know and see if anything comes up. So, yeah, these are the things. Now you are uh, 50. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so any other questions you have? No, 
I think this is rich enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Do you want to say something to the people who are listening to this thing? Um, Some messages, how they can reach you and uh, what and all they can actually uh, do with you. <laughs> <laughs> They can come die with me. <laughs> <laughs> die the before you die. The birds. I die live from you fire. Die. You know? die it's interesting you when you eh? die before you what die. You come on, die before you die. We die before you die. Die while being alive. <laughs> and true knowing shall come to you. This is one of the poetry of Lala, actually. Mm -hmm. Die while we still alive and true knowing shall come to you. Yeah, I think the things that you saw that uh, brought familiarity or things I am reflected is uh, I have this ability to, to cut the bullshit very quickly, also with my students. So I don't engage in spaces that are not real and they love it because they feel they can really move through their own illusion. So that I guess is my Agni, my God of fire that you described now, that's how I understood it you know, burning to that which is not true. One of my teachers told me that only that which is not true, we can burn because the truth cannot burn. So all that we burning is the bullshit really and the confusion. And uh, I just want to say, it's been so lovely to meet you Arun and to <laughs> feel your uh, uh, devotion to this teaching and your joyful dedication. And uh, I really hope one day I can meet you in India when... Yeah. Thank you for listening to my podcast. You could connect with me in arunsyoga.in where you could see my contact details, including my phone number, my WhatsApp and email ID. Stay tuned for more exciting episodes.